All right. We are going to open up to Revelation chapter 13. And today is one of those days. You might want to put your seatbelts on. We're going to have to go quickly here. <laughs> Thankfully, everything is recorded. It's all online. You can go back and listen again. Uh, and you can catch the details, you could rewind, you could slow me down if you need to uh, on YouTube. So, uh, Revelation chapter 13. I've entitled this morning's message, The Mark of the Beast Part 1. The Mark of the Beast Part 1. There will be at least three messages here in this series on the Mark of the Beast. And the subtitle this morning is, <clears throat> The Future is Now. The Future is Now. Revelation chapter 13 in verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Verse 15, Revelation 13, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding, calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Incredibly, the word of God accurately predicted our modern technological age. There's no possible way in human history that all the world can see an event all at the same time. Because all the world can't get on a ship, imagine 2,000 years ago when this was written, talking about the whole world is going to do this, the whole world is going to see this. It was impossible to get the inhabitants of the world all to Jerusalem or to any place actually until we had the modern technology through our satellites, through our smartphones, through Wi-Fi, through internet connections, through the World Wide Web actually, that now we can see things happening anywhere at the world, uh, uh, in the world, all at the same time. Instantaneously, literally, at the speed of light, information is traveling right now, even through this room in the airwaves. Information is traveling uh, through radio frequencies incredibly. That, those radio frequencies are going through a camera. They're going through satellites. They're flying all over the world. And there's people in different parts of the world. I think we have a gentleman that watches in Kenya every time we're live. Good morning if you're watching live in Kenya this morning. We have friends in Tel Aviv, Israel who are watching live. Uh, we have friends around the country in Montana and other places, Idaho that I know are watching this service live. How is that possible? It's only because of our modern technology. How do images and sounds float through the air and somehow magically appear right here on this little piece of black glass, right? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's like, it's like sorcery or magic or something for the ancient world. They couldn't understand this, no doubt. And yet John wrote that this is exactly uh, what is going to happen in the last days. The whole world uh, is going to be able to see things at the same time. The whole world is going to be able to do things at the same time. For example, we read in Revelation 13 and verse 3, and I saw one of his heads, this is a head of the beast, it's a head of state, this is the Antichrist, a head of state of the revived Roman Empire, uh, the United uh, uh, States of Europe, likely. I saw one of his heads, this leader, as if it had been mortally wounded. He was the one in verse 14 who was wounded by the sword and lived. This would uh, speak of an assassination, this would speak of a violent attack against him, and yet he survives this attack or he supposedly is resurrected from the dead, purportedly. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded or wounded unto death, but his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed after the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? So this would have been 
impossible up until the modern age for the whole world to see someone assassinated or purportedly assassinated and then to see this individual, the whole world marveled and followed the beast because they saw that he was raised from the dead, at least purportedly raised from the dead. It's a counterfeit resurrection, of course. He's a counterfeit Christ. He's the Antichrist. And then they, they worship. The whole world worships the dragon. The dragon in Revelation chapter 12 was identified as the devil. And the whole world worshiped the beast. Now, this would have been impossible until, again, our modern times and our modern technological age. It's incredible that the Bible tells us that all of this is going to culminate with the devil's mark. All this devil worship, all of this uh, Satanism is going to uh, come to a, a head, as it were, in the middle of the tribulation period, after this assassination attempt, after this counterfeit resurrection, because then the Antichrist is going to require the whole world to take a mark upon the right hand or upon their forehead. Again, uh, any time in history, even 50 years ago, this would not have been possible to put a mark on everybody and to require them in the whole world that if you don't have this mark, you will not be able to buy or to sell. But this is exactly what the Bible said is going to happen in the last days. Again, verse 16 of Revelation 13 says, he causes all. This is the whole world he's referencing here. Not just the people in the Roman Empire, not just the people in Israel or in Jerusalem. The whole world is being referenced. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark uh, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. We'll look at this in more detail, but the 666 uh, is everywhere. The 666 is everywhere. It's become popular. Uh, it's become popular with musicians and rappers and all the rest trying to be edgy, trying to be cool. But the 666 is the number that's given here. Now, six is the number of man, scripturally. Uh, one is the number of God. Uh, the Lord is one, although he's three persons. A trinity, is, is the number three is the number of the trinity. Uh, number six is the number of man in biblical numerology because man was created on the sixth day. Uh, number seven is the number of completion, totality, or perfection. And man is one number short of that number of perfection of totality. Uh, the number three is the number for the Trinity, the triunity of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So this is a man who's saying you could become God. You could become like God. The Trinity, God is one, per, uh, one God, three persons. Six, the number of a man. Somehow man is going to become like God. This is a promise uh, of the Antichrist and of the devil. Uh, of course, this was the lie of Satan in the Garden of Eden to Eve, too. He came up to her and he said, hath God said you cannot eat of any tree? She goes, oh, we can eat of, of all the trees, just not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, oh, he says, well, why not? She says, well, because we're going to die. And he says, oh, you're not going to die. You're going to become like God. You're going to become God-like. You're going to be just like God. And God's trying to prevent you from becoming like himself. He's keeping something back that's good for you uh, and, 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 you know, the forbidden fruit and all the rest. And so this 666, we'll look at the, the number in, in some more detail later and what it might mean. Nobody really knows. I think they're going to know, obviously, at the time when it's issued. There's going to be no question that people are taking a mark that's identifying with the Antichrist, with the dragon, the devil. And it will be devil worship. And if you refuse to worship the devil at this point and take his mark, his identifying mark, you will be excluded from the economy. Eventually you will be rounded up and you will be uh, beheaded according to the scriptures. Uh, this is what's going to happen for the tribulation saints. Uh, it's interesting that the 666 is becoming more popular in our culture as we get closer to the uh, advent of these prophecies being fulfilled. Um, you, you remember uh, just a few years ago, the rapper, who's just a freak, Little Nas X, uh, he, he just did another video, by the way, where he's calling himself Jesus, and he's hanging on a cross like Jesus, and he acts like he's a shepherd, uh, and he's shearing all these sheep in this video, and then he's making wolf skins to, for these wolves to put the sheep's uh, garments over them, wolves in sheep's clothing. It's just unbelievable the sort of stuff that's happening that people are watching and that people are uh, uh, singing and all the rest. But he had these, these devil shoes, and I found this article that I had saved. And it says this about these, these shoes that Lil Nas X, this Satanist, he's a homosexual, Satanist, African-American rapper. So um, Lil Nas X, he has these uh, 
shoes in this entertainment article. It says, rapper Little Nas X's Nike Satan shoes spark outrage. Yes, they contain one drop of human blood. Uh, this was March 30th, 2021, this article. Just days after the controversial music video for his new single, Montero, Call Me By Your Name, went viral, rapper Lil Nas X is stoking outrage again over the release of a pair of shoes. Lil Nas X, who rose to fame after his debut single, The Old Town Road, became a phenomenon. And by the way, The Old Town Road speaks of the first musician who sold their soul to the devil, uh, Robert Johnson, back in the 1930s, who was the founder of modern rock and roll music, actually. He was the first person that died at age 27 of the 27 Club. And so Lil Nas X wrote his song, The Old Town Road, speaking of uh, Robert Johnson selling his soul to the devil. It says, after it became a global phenomenon, he created the Satan Shoes in collaboration with the MSCHF clothing brand, according to cultural news outlet Saint, the shoes will reportedly contain 66, notice the 66, 66 cc's of red ink and one drop of human blood in its sole. Other features of the internal, uh, infernal footwear are a pentagram pendant. The pentagram is the uh, upside down, uh, uh, well, the satanic pentagram is the upside down star. Speaking of the stars falling from heaven, the demons that fell with Satan. Uh, over the laces, and the scripture verse, Luke 10, 18, is written on the side. A Bible verse about Satan's fall from heaven. Uh, that's where Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. They put Luke 10, 18 right on the shoe, along with uh, 66 cc's of red ink and one drop of real human blood into each of his tennis shoes. Notice this. Only 666, 666 of the limited edition shoes set to be released on March 29, 2011 will be produced. And each pair will be individually numbered. And the price tag is $1,018 for Luke 10, 18. While the shoes are Nike's classics Air Max 97s, the shoe company has stated it's not involved with the creation or sale of the devilish kicks. It says Nike did not release nor design these shoes. Uh, and, of course, it was an uproar, but the shoes sold out immediately. The 666 pairs sold out as soon as he put them out for $1,018 for Luke 1018, one drop of human blood, the pentagram on the shoes, the 666. Uh, you uh, may have been here on, on Wednesday night. Um, we saw that there was a movie that recently came out, a satanic movie. And this, uh, let's see if I can find this article real quick. This movie sold a total, that, that, well, let me tell you what the title of the movie is. This is from a couple weeks ago. The movie's called Late Night with the Devil. And it's about a demon-possessed girl uh, that goes on a uh, talk show. And somehow unleashes, unleashes evil into the living rooms of everyone who watches the show. It's called um, Late Night with the Devil. This is on the Guardian news source. Um, which is a found footage horror about a 1977 live television broadcast which accidentally unleashes evil into America's living room. It's all about the devil. It took in 666666 dollars exactly on Sunday. The Sunday before Easter on, I think it's March 25th, Palm Sunday. A found footage horror about a 1977 live television broadcast which accidentally unleashes evil into America's living rooms took $666,666 on Sunday in the United States. As Variety reports, the verified takings for the film contributed to an overall $2.8 million weekend take, a slightly less satanic figure, while Ghostbusters Frozen Empire topped the charts with 45 Million. This is legitimate, guys. It's legitimate. This movie made exactly 666, 666 uh, on Palm Sunday. So you can't, you you just can't really make this stuff up, honestly. It's just it's just Satan showing his hand uh, everywhere you look. It's uh, hidden in plain sight, uh, but he is not really trying to hide uh, very much uh, anymore. 
The Bible tells us that if you do not have this, this mark for the tribulation saints, we're not going to be here. The church will be raptured before this happens. I did an eight-part series on the timing of the rapture back in September uh, of 2023. I encourage you to go back and listen to it. And I think that after you listen to the eight messages, you will be convinced of the pre-tribulation rapture that we're not going to be here for any uh, of the tribulation period. So this is not us. This is for the tribulation saints, those who are not Christians, who are not taken at the rapture of the church. They're not going to be able to buy or sell. Now, we recently had a, a virus uh, that shut everything down around the world. Incredibly, shut everything down around the world. And when they reopened everything again, all the businesses and all the rest, uh, they uh, required that if you did not wear initially wear a mask or require your customers to wear a mask, you could not open your business. You could not sell your, ge your gear or your wares or whatever it is unless people wore the mask. You remember, there were the mask police and people turning in their neighbors and all the rest. Uh, so you couldn't buy or sell if you didn't wear a mask. And then in some places, it actually came to the point where you could not buy or sell unless you got the shot, right? Unless you got the, the vaccine. You were not allowed to buy or sell. In many places, New York City, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, the city of San Francisco, many places around the world, especially in Europe, Australia was, was horrible with this. They were arresting people uh, for not getting the vaccine. And so you see that it was kind of a trial run. It was kind of like a, uh, like a precursor uh, to what is coming. It was, it was like a, a, a rehearsal for what's going to happen. And they, sh they saw the powers that be that they could shut everything down. And then they could require people to do these things in order to be able to enter back into society. Again, you couldn't even see your, your loved one in a, in a senior citizen home and people died alone. Uh, it was very, very tragic and very sad. It's interesting. I watched the movie recently, uh, Contagion. Uh, which is fascinating because it was made in 2011, which means it was actually filmed probably in 2009 and 2010. But they laid out the exact scenario that we had in 2020 with the coronavirus. It's, it's really interesting. You go back and read it. It came from a bat. It was a biological weapon in the movie. The drug companies made gazillions of dollars in the movie. Now, differently in the movie, people were dead within a few days who got the, the virus, and it was a horrible, terrible thing, and uh, millions and millions and millions of people died around the world in the movie in the first uh, couple of months and all the rest. So, uh, but it, it, it kind of gave the idea of maybe what was coming, uh, uh, it, the gain-of-function uh, um, technology, where uh, this, uh, uh, in the movie, it, the, the, the virus went from a bat to a pig and from the pig, it spread to humans. Now, in nature, that doesn't happen. That's called a biological weapon. In nature, you don't get an avian flu H1N1 virus that goes to a mammal. In nature, um, you don't get viruses that jump from species. It just doesn't happen. It's called a biological weapon. They've been working on these things for a long time, even in our own uh, bio biological weapon labs here in the United States. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all of that. But it, suffice it to say... Uh, this is exactly what the movie said was going to happen. It was going to come from animals, it was going to go to farm animals, and then it was going to go to humans. Um, you remember that they said initially uh, that they got the, uh, that the COVID uh, virus came from what? From bats, that they were eating bats or whatever there in China, and somehow it went from a bat to a human, and then it spread to humans, which again, doesn't happen in nature. That's not uh, natural. That's, uh, uh, again, gain-of-function technology. But did you know that they also, in January of 2020, they also issued for the first time in our history on our currency, on our coin, in January 2020, they issued a quarter with a bat on it. I've got one right here. There's two bats on it, actually. It's a mother and a baby bat. January of 2020, this hit the circulation. I've got, I think, five of them. I save them every time I find them because people don't believe it's true. It is true. It's hidden in plain sight. Uh, it, it is uh, interesting. We lost our constitutional freedoms. We lost our freedom of assembly. We lost our freedom of free speech. They censored everything. Matter of fact, this sermon is probably going to be censored online just because I'm talking about it, you see. And so the powers that be, you know, they, they, they understand that they have, they, they have power to shut us down. We couldn't even uh, uh, practice our faith because it was illegal in California for us to meet publicly. We were breaking the law when we came and we assembled to uh, exercise our right of freedom of religion. Uh, that's right, we did. <laughs> this was a uh, rehearsal for what they say is coming, by the way. 
They say that a disease X, the World Health Organization, is warning the world, along with Bill Gates and others, that the disease X is coming. And it's going to be far worse, the worst thing we've ever seen. As a matter of fact, you already have right now uh, this bird avian flu that is uh, coming from wild birds. You listen in the news. It's there. Coming from wild birds, it's transferring to domestic chickens. From the chickens, it's somehow going to cows in the dairy farms. And from the cows, it's going to humans. But don't worry. The humans aren't, you know, spreading it to other humans just yet. But this is happening right now uh, in the news. But this disease X, the World Health Organization, is saying it's going to be so bad that the World Health Organization needs to have the power to take over all of the health services of the whole world when disease X happens. It's interesting that the World Health Organization uh, is based in uh, Switzerland, along with uh, the World Economic Forum is based in Davos, Switzerland, along with CERN, the uh, Large Hadron Collider that's smashing protons together trying to discover dark matter and open portals to other dimensions is located in Switzerland. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in Switzerland, uh, actually. But this is, this is uh, an article on uh, the, the who, WHO agreement that is being required. This WHO agreement is being required. This is from Fox News. It says, Disease X. Critics say the Biden administration is selling out U.S. sovereignty with the World Health Organization Treaty. Some of you may know of this. Some of you may not. You could look this up for yourself online. It's on Fox News Online. This article is just from a couple weeks ago, March 28th, 2024. And it says, critics say the Biden administration selling out U.S. sovereignty with the World Health Organization Treaty. The Biden administration is negotiating a controversial global pandemic treaty with the World Health Organization, the WHO, that the health agency says will help the world prepare for the next pandemic and the potential outbreak of disease X. But critics say the agreement will end up stifling free speech and cede American sovereignty to the global body. The WHO has been sounding the alarm for months that a May deadline, May of 2024, for having the text of the treaty agreed upon is fast approaching. An accord, it says, is necessary to bolster the world's collective preparedness and response to future pandemics, unquote. The health agency wants to ratify the treaty at the World Health Assembly at its May 2024 annual general assembly last week dozens of former heads of state including uk former ministers tony blair and gordon brown as well as a u.n secretary uh, ban ki moon penned a joint letter urging accelerated progress in current negotiations while who director tedros Ghebreyesus has been warning that agreement is needed for when comma not if unquote disease x strikes Disease X is a hypothetical placeholder virus that has not yet been formed, but scientists say it could be 20 times deadlier than COVID-19. How do they know that? How do they know that? You may say I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I don't know. It's kind of obvious to me. It's kind of hidden in plain sight. It's interesting that the World uh, Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, uh, its logo, if you look at the World Economic Forum, Forum's page. The logo is a 666 in the World Economic Forum logo. It's, it's kind of like a line that goes through the words, and it makes a 6, a 6, and a 6. Of course, the World Economic Forum was founded by Klaus Schwab, I believe in 1971 or 1972. He's a globalist, and he believes that, that the world would be better off if we didn't have sovereign nations anymore, just a one-world government uh, to, to take care of everything, to rule the world. He's the one that came up with the 2030 Agenda, uh, where he says, you'll own nothing, and you'll be happy. You'll be own nothing and, and like it, he says, in his 20, by 2030. Also in the 2030 Agenda, it says from the World Economic Forum, and by the way, this is Davos, Switzerland, where all the billionaires fly in their private jets, to fight climate change as they're flying in their private jets and everything else, uh, uh, burning jet fuel and polluting the environment to go save the planet. But, but all the billionaires and all the who's who and all the world leaders go to Davos, Switzerland every January for these World Economic Forum meetings. This is not a small thing. But they say in their 2030 agenda, you can look it up online, that America will no longer be the world superpower by 2030. They only have about five and a half years to make that happen. That's their goal. America will no longer be the sole superpower of the world by 2030. And the U.S. dollar will no longer be the world's reserve currency. Right now, the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. They sell oil only in U.S. dollars. Uh, and uh, every bank in the world has to keep U.S. dollars on hand. 
uh, it is the world's reserve currency. But there will be a point, they say, where the U.S. dollar is not going to be the world's re reserve currency anymore. It will be a one-world digital currency that will be issued, a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, which is a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum, these, these uh, cryptocurrencies uh, that are out there right now. It's, it's kind of getting uh, people acclimated to it. You know, use your phone to pay for stuff, uh, your, 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 your iPhone or whatever with your wallet. Uh, and so we're being conditioned not to use cash. We're being conditioned everything to go digital. Uh, this is also uh, what is called the fourth industrial revolution where Klaus Schwab says it's going to be a merger at that point of man and machine transhumanism uh, where you implant uh, computer chips into people's bodies and somehow they are able to be uh, enhanced and become uh, super uh, humans or whatever. Whatever. This is what they believe is going to happen uh, by 2030, the merger of man and machine transhumanism. Uh, it's interesting that they uh, uh, came out in uh, July of 2020 during COVID with the phrase, build back better. And this was a catchphrase for the World Economic Forum's 2030 agenda. So whenever you heard world leaders talking, they said, we've got to build back better. Everywhere around the world, that's what they were saying. What are we going to do about COVID? We've got to build back better. Well, this is the mantra that came from the World Economic Forum. You can look it up online on their website. They created the saying, build back better. By the way, if you look at build back better, it's a BBB. If you look at it in small lowercase, what's it look like? It looks like a 666. BBB in lowercase is 666. Build back better. It's interesting, and not, no politics here, but it's interesting that that became uh, Joe Biden's campaign slogan. If you go back and look, his campaign slogan was Build Back Better, which came from the World Economic Forum, which has the 2030 agenda, the fourth industrial revolution, and all the rest. Um, it, it is interesting. I found this interesting when this Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed, which has never happened before in history. I mean, how many times in your lifetime have you ever seen a freight liner run into a pylon, a bridge, and take the whole bridge down, especially in Washington, D.C., trapping some of our naval vessels that are in that bay that can't get out now and uh, uh, causing tremendous problems with uh, supply chain issues and all the rest over there. Um, but it was interesting. I was listening to uh, a man who was interviewed on NPR News, because NPR News is kind of like the, you know, the information that they want the public to know and, and, and so forth. Uh, the, the elite people own uh, the news sources and all the rest, of course. And um, this uh, individual that was being interviewed, this is the day it happened, March 26, 2024. I got a transcript of it because I heard on the radio. I just couldn't believe it. So Mary Louise Kelly, who was the host, she was asking questions of this expert, Stephen Flynn. He's an expert in critical infrastructure and supply chain resilience, and he's also a former officer in the U.S. Coast Guard. And uh, she's asking him about the problems of this Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsing. And by the way, Francis Scott Key uh, is the one who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. So it's kind of symbolic that the Star Spangled Banner Bridge is down. Um, but she asked him, like, what is your view? Like, what is the priority at this point? This is the day it happened. He says, well... There really is, and this is the end of, of his interview. He says, well, there really is. I think the biggest issue here is the bridge failure itself and the lack of safeguard that we had in place to protect that pylon. That's the focus. What they, obviously, there are uh, very important questions about how the ship itself, how it was handled, and what the source of it losing its way and causing the collision that took place was. But the other real issue we have to focus on is what does the recovery look like? How do we rebuild and hopefully build back better, he says. It's the end of his article. How do we rebuild and hopefully build back better? So when I heard that, I thought, huh, maybe this wasn't an accident. You're like, wow, you are a conspiracy theorist. It's easy to hack stuff. And people aren't driving these massive, you know, thousand feet long freight liners they're not driving them. GPS is driving them. Computers are driving them. And if you see the video, it looks like that thing went off. The lights went off, went on, went off, went on. It turned and it accelerated right at that pylon. Exactly the place, the weak point of the bridge uh, to take the whole thing down. It's interesting in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2 uh, that we're told that when the Antichrist comes... Uh, it says, I looked and behold a white horse. This is the Antichrist coming on the scene. He who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. But he didn't conquer with war or with violence. He didn't shoot an arrow or fire a shot. There's no war that's mentioned. But he takes over the world 
with a crown. And the Latin word for crown is corona. Spanish word for crown too, corona. So in the Latin Vulgate, uh, one of the most uh, ancient translations of the Bible from the 4th century A.D. all the way until the 15th, 16th century A.D., when you read your Bible in Latin, you would read, he's going to come with a corona and he's going to take over the world without firing a shot. So it's, it's, it's all very interesting. Uh, COVID, the name COVID, uh, if you look at it backwards, because in Satanism everything is backwards, as above, so below, and all the rest, um, the uh, word COVID backwards is, is divok or divok, and it's the Hebrew word for being possessed by an evil spirit. You can't make this stuff up, but you could go verify everything that I'm telling you. I found it all online. <laughs> divok from the Jewish virtual library of uh, this project, it says this. This is a Jewish site. It says, in Jewish folklore, a popular belief uh, is an evil spirit entering a living person which cleaves to his soul, causes mental illness, talks through his mouth, and represents a separate and alien personality. It's called a divok. And they, they spell it D-I-B-B-U-K, but it's also D-I-V-O-K. And it basically means a cleavage uh, upon someone from an evil spirit. Now, to really blow your mind, to really blow your mind, Divok is also a tracking program that is sold with implantable, or you could even just put it on your phone, uh, vaccine passports, which are being introduced all over the world for the next uh, pandemic X, virus disease X, so that you have your vaccine passport on your phone so you can show everybody that you're vaccinated to get into church or get into your uh, uh, business or what have you, go shopping. So this is from the Divoc website, and Divoc uh, says it is a digital infrastructure for verifiable open credentialing. This is what they say Divoc means. What is Divoc? The digital inter infrastructure for variable open credentialing, or Divoc, which is COVID backwards, is an open source platform that enables countries to digitally orchestrate large scale, large scale health campaigns such as vaccination, and certification programs. Learn more about the platform on the Divoc website or contact us for more details. Uh, it says it was built in India for the world as a digital public good. Divoc is a flexible and extendable software that can be used across multiple health programs. It is scalable. It is data-driven architecture, which allows it to deal with diverse country-specific scenarios. In a vaccination program, for example... It gives countries the ability to manage and control vaccines, facilities, and vaccinators systematically across geographies, as well as generate digitally variable certificates that are compliant with international standards. The platform is modular, enabling countries to use the components together or as an individual standalone solution according to their need for end-to-end -end vaccination and certification. I could go on. This is from their website, Divok. COVID backwards, which means in Hebrew, be, to be possessed by an evil spirit. I mean, I don't know. Call me a conspiracy theorist. It it's just blows your mind. So we are, we are living, as I, as I said at the beginning, the future is now. I'm not bringing you any secret information. This is all public information that I'm quoting to you this morning. Uh, the future is now. Turn to Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. The Lord Jesus tells us this about his coming for his church. He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he re will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch, 
and find them. So blessed are those servants, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus Christ is coming back again. And, and he's coming back again at a time when people probably aren't really going to be looking for him. And I don't know. I look around the church. I look around the world. And people aren't really looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ anymore. They're looking really for uh, whatever uh, this digital world can bring in the sense of making man uh, and machine merge. I mean, you look at Elon Musk with the Neuralink uh, transmitter implanted in that man's brain. And the man is paralyzed from the neck down. And he can move a cursor and play chess with his mind just with his thoughts. It's just the beginning. You see, and it's great for people who are paralyzed. I broke my neck when I was 18. And so I, I broke the same vertebrae that that guy broke. I broke C4 in a car accident. Um, and so I, you know, I, I appreciate that they're able to give someone who's, who's quadriplegic the ability to, to, to use their brain to play video games or, or, or what have you or play chess. But, but the bottom line is it's not going to stop there. If you listen to Elon Musk, he wants to merge man and machine, transhumanism, and make us more like the matrix, more like cyborgs, so that we can keep up with, he says, we can keep up with artificial uh, intelligence. It's interesting that uh, Jesus says uh, in Luke chapter 17 concerning his return, he says in verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what is Jesus telling us? He says it's going to happen at a time when people aren't expecting it. The rapture is going to happen at a time. The church is going to be caught up to be with the Lord at a time when people are not expecting it. When people are not, look, like Jesus said, I'm coming at an hour you do not expect. It's interesting that Jesus also says this in verse 34 concerning his coming. He says, I tell you in that night... There will be two men in bed, literally two people in bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. Like a believing wife with an unbelieving husband or vice versa. A believing husband with an unbelieving wife laying in bed. It will be nighttime. One will be taken, one will be left. This is the rapture of the church. Then he says two women will be grinding together, like grinding at the mill together working. The one will be taken and the other left. And two men will be in the field working. One will be taken and the other left. Incredibly, Jesus is telling us when the rapture happens, it's going to be nighttime for half the world. Two people are going to be in bed sleeping. And it's going to be daytime on the other half of the world because people are going to be working in the fields uh, during the daytime. They didn't know that the world was round and that it was night and day on opposite sides of the planet until probably about 14, 12 to 1400 years after Jesus said this. Uh, indicating, of course, that Jesus knows what he's talking about. So it's, uh, uh, it, is, it is a very interesting uh, era and, and day uh, that we are living in. The future uh, is now. Turn with me to Luke chapter 21. We read in verse 9, Jesus says this concerning his second coming. Leading up to his second coming, leading up to the rapture of the church when the church is taken to heaven before the tribulation period and the mark of the beast and all the rest. Jesus says, when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs in the heavens. It's interesting that Jesus mentions earthquakes. I talked about this on Wednesday night. And then after we taught this on Wednesday night, what happened? On Friday, there was a big earthquake in New York, which is very, very unusual. I think it was Friday. Maybe it was Thursday. It was uh, April 5th, 6th, 7th. So it was Friday. Uh, not only did uh, 
New Jersey have the biggest earthquake in 142 years. They don't get earthquakes over there. They don't have any tectonic plates. So they don't know how these earthquakes are happening where there's no tectonic plates. They're changing their science on seismology. Uh, but it's interesting. That if you look at the, the video and the pictures, the Statue of Liberty was struck by lightning at the same time. I don't know if you saw the picture of the Statue of Liberty with the torch being struck by lightning in New York in the harbor out there. Uh, uh, the same day that this earthquake happened. It's incredible to me. Also, on April 5th, not just in New Jersey, the largest earthquake in 142 years, but there was also a 4.5 earthquake that day in Northern California, in Chico. That's a pretty good-sized earthquake. There was also a 6.0 earthquake in Tonga the same day, South Pacific Ocean. There was a 5.8 earthquake the same day on April 5th in Myanmar, in Burma. There was a 4.6 earthquake the same day uh, in Iran on April 5th. This is all over the world. And then there was a 6.8 big earthquake in the West Pacific Ocean in the Mariana Islands. This all happened on April 5th. Uh, of course, there was the big earthquake in Taiwan on April 3rd. They initially said it was a 7.7. Then they rated it down to a 7.4. Now they're rating it down to a 7.2. Uh, but it was the biggest earthquake in Taiwan in 25 years. I believe nine dead, 900 uh, injured. And then there was a 6.1 earthquake a few days before that on April 1st in northern Japan. So these are, these are pretty sizable earthquakes. Uh, it's in places where you don't normally expect it, and it's happening all over the world, all within the same period of time. That's what we'd expect to see if we're living in the last days, because Jesus said you're going to expect to see an increase in earthquakes in the last days. Uh, he also said there's going to be an increase in wars. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars, and I don't have time to get into it, but uh, Israel is about to be attacked by Iran. Israel assassinated seven Revolutionary Guard Corps members, including the Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahidi, who was the mastermind of the October 7th attacks from Iran. He was in Syria, in Damascus, at a meeting at their embassy, uh, uh, actually just right next to their embassy. Uh, and Israel had a precision strike with F-35 jets, and uh, they just oblit obliterated this entire building. Uh, and killed these uh, seven uh, leading um, Iranian Quds Revolutionary Guard members. It's a big deal. It's the big, he's, the, he's the biggest general that was there in the Middle East. He was the one orchestrating the arms from Iran into Syria, into Lebanon, to Hezbollah. Uh, and ultimately, they were the ones that were supplying the arms to Hamas uh, there in the Gaza Strip. So Israel did this. Um, they attacked a, a, a diplomatic uh, immunity site, which is sovereign land. So in essence, by, by attacking this embassy, uh, they attacked Iranian sovereign land because an embassy in another country is sovereign territory of that nation. And so uh, Iran is ready to respond, uh, and they're going to respond uh, uh, fiercely against Israel. Uh, if, if they attack Israel too fiercely, Israel will respond, and Israel will wipe out their nuclear facilities. Uh, in, in, in Iran. They're ready to push the buttons. They have the codes on the GPS coordinates ready to go. Uh, so Iran may not uh, do anything too crazy yet. But the Bible does tell us there's going to be an invasion in the last days that's going to come from the north with armies from Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Russia, uh, and Turkey, as well as Sudan and Libya. And we know that all of those countries are in Syria right now at Israel's border. Uh, it's interesting, the big story, of course, is the, is the solar eclipse. You're probably wondering, are you going to get to the solar eclipse? What is that, chopped liver? I mean, <laughs> the solar eclipse is a big deal, too. It's a big deal to have a solar eclipse. It only happens once or twice, perhaps in a lifetime, uh, that you even potentially could see a solar eclipse. I wished, I tried, I wanted to get out there to see this eclipse, but it just uh, wasn't going to happen. But... Um, Suffice it to say, the Lord tells us that there's going to be signs in the heavens in the last days. He says in verse 11, Jesus says there's going to be earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences. Pestilences, by the way, are diseases. Pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs in the heavens. Sights and signs in the heavens. We're told way back in the book of Genesis when God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. We're told in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. I'll read it to you. Then the Lord said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. The lights and the stars, the sun, the moon, 
the stars. He says, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So the heavens are there not just to give us light, but also to give us signs from God. That's what God says. Uh, any ancient people looked at a, at, a, at a total solar eclipse as something catastrophic. You can look at all of ancient history and even modern history and see that people thought it was a big deal because this, it's like God turned the lights out in the middle of the day. That's a scary thing. They didn't know how it would work. Incredibly, the moon uh, is exactly at the right distance from the earth, about 200,000 miles, to block the sun. And the sun itself uh, is 400 times further away from the earth than the moon is, and the moon happens to be 400 times smaller than the sun, so it just perfectly blocks the sun, which is incredible. The odds of this are beyond astronomical, that you have an earth and you have a moon that blocks out a sun that is so massive, and the moon is so small, and yet the moon blocks the sun for four and a half minutes during a total solar eclipse. The ancient people saw it as an omen. The Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incas, they would have been slaughtering people during this time because they would have been afraid that the sun may never come back. But God says it is a sign from him that he puts the stars and the sun and the moon and the heavens to be signs for us and for seasons. Jesus says in Luke 21 and verse 25 about the last days, he says there's going to be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on earth distress of nations with perplexity of the sea and the waves roaring. So Jesus says in the last days... Before my coming, there's going to be signs in the heavens, uh, the signs in the sun and the moon specifically, as well as the stars. Of course, the Old Testament spoke uh, about this often, speaking of uh, the end times in the last days. I'll read just a couple of passages for you. In Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 9, the prophet Isaiah said, this is written 700 years before the birth of Christ, so some 2,700 years ago. Uh, we read this, Isaiah 13, 9, behold... The day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He will destroy its sinners from it. And you see how wicked our nation is and how wicked we're becoming, how wicked the world is. Every man is doing what's right in his own eyes. It's pure Satanism. Uh, It's a mantra of our culture. Do whatever you want. And God is going to judge. He's going to destroy the sinners from it. And notice this, verse 10 of Isaiah 13. For the stars of heaven... And their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth. And the moon will not cause its light to shine. So God is talking about signs in the heavens where the sun goes dark and the moon goes dark. So if you see a solar eclipse in the last days, you may want to pay attention. It might be a sign from God. He says in verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Are we ripe for judgment as a nation? I think we are. Billy Graham used to say back in the 1960s that if God doesn't judge America for her sins, then he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for wiping them out. Because we're worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, actually. He says, I'll punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud. I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make mortal a mortal man more rare than fine gold, uh, more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, verse 13 of Isaiah 13, I will shake the heavens, the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. There's going to be cataclysmic signs uh, that are going to be taking place as you uh, come to the culmination of the return of Jesus Christ. They're going to come with greater frequency and greater intensity, like the birth pangs of a woman who's about to give birth to a child. Joel chapter 2 talks about this. Joel 2 and verse 10, I'll read it to you. The earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness, and the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can endure it? Day of the Lord is speaking of the great tribulation period where God's wrath is unleashed upon a world that will take a 666 on their right hand and forehead and worship the devil. That's going to be too much for God. When the devil claims to be God and demands to be worshipped as God, that's, that's it. God is going to wipe out this planet and Jesus Christ is going to return to save the nation of Israel and to set up his kingdom. 
in Joel chapter 2 and verse 30. Joel says this about the last days. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And so we would expect to see total solar eclipses and total lunar, lunar eclipses. And by the way, it's only because we have the technology that the whole world can witness these things. We don't have to go to Texas or Mexico to see it. We can watch it on our phones now, right, or our TVs. We can watch the thing live because uh, of our technology. So the whole world is going to experience this eclipse, even if you're not there in the uh, path of totality. In Joel chapter 3, one more verse, uh, Joel says this. He says, the sun and the moon will grow dark, Joel 3, verse 15, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Uh, it's interesting, it's not just this eclipse, because Jesus says signs in the heavens, not just solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, but other signs in the heavens. Uh, you have space junk that's literally crashing into our atmosphere, that people are filming with their phones, and it looks like CGI from an Avengers movie or something, or a Star Wars movie. You see this satellite breaking up. They say it's a satellite from uh, China, a uh, Chinese space satellite, the space junk after it delivered this Chinese uh, astronauts. It fell to the earth. And people in Los Angeles at 1.35 in the morning, on Monday night I think it was, were out there filming this stuff, this fire from the sky falling to the earth. Signs in the heavens. Again, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, people would have thought it was the end of the world just seeing some of the space junk come into our atmosphere and burn up. Uh, it, it is interesting that there's also this uh, devil comet that's going to be seen during this time. And uh, they call this the devil comet uh, because it looks like it has two horns uh, like a, a, a devil. And uh, so, so I'll read this article to you. This is from The Guardian. Uh, and it says this, larger than Everest, so this comet is larger than Mount Everest, which is the biggest mountain on earth, larger than Everest comet could become visible to the naked eye this month. This uh, article was uh, March 11th, 2024. It says, Haley-type comet that orbits the earth once every 71.3 years will be easier to spot as it passes by bright stars, says astronomers. A comet that is larger than Mount Everest could become visible to the naked eye in the coming weeks as it continues to visit the inner solar system for the first time in more than 70 years. Uh, it is a, a Halley-type comet, meaning um, it's uh, once or twice in a lifetime. Uh, 12P Pons Brooks, as it is known, completes its orbit once every 71.3 years, and it's due to make its closest approach to the sun on April 21st. Um, Let's see where it talks about it being called the devil comet here. Well, the title tells you that they call it the devil comet. I don't see it here in the, in the article itself. I mean, there's a lot of articles. You could look at this thing uh, online. But it, they say that it, it looks like it has kind of like uh, devil horns, like a, like a dragon or something that's going through space. And it's got these horns. And you're going to be able to see it tomorrow if you're in the path of totality when the sun is darkened you're going to be able to see this devil comet that's there uh, in the sky during the daytime. So again, just interesting signs in the heavens, as Jesus predicted uh, would be the case. Uh, it, it is also interesting that NASA is sending out uh, rockets. They're launching three rockets up into space tomorrow to study how the sudden drop in sunlight affects our upper atmosphere. And the mission, which is known as the Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path, or APIP for short, is led by Eric Barakti, a professor of engineering physics, uh, where he directs the Space and Atmospheric Inst Instrumentation Lab. Now, it's interesting that APAP, A-P-A-P, is the name of a serpent deity. It says this, this is from Forbes, actually. The Space Agency's project, Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path, or APEP, will investigate how the drop in sunlight and temperature affects the Earth's upper atmosphere, Apep is named after the serpent deity from ancient Egyptian mythology, the nemesis of the sun deity Ra, according to NASA. Not according to some fire and brimstone Baptist or Pentecostal preacher somewhere. This is NASA. It's Apep. They named it that. After a serpent deity from the ancient Egyptian mythology, 
And then if you look up what Apep means in ancient Egyptian mythology, it's also uh, spelled Epipi or Apep or Apophis in the Greek. It was a serpent demon who represented the forces of chaos, death, and disorder. As such, he was the mortal enemy and polar opposite of order, personified as the goddess Maat, and light as incarnated in the form of Ra. And this, again, is not from some crazy harebrained preacher. This is from the New World Encyclopedia. You can look it up for yourself. A-P-E-P. So that's happening also tomorrow uh, during the uh, uh, eclipse. You know, the CERN reactor, I mentioned it earlier in, in Davos, Switzerland, or in Switzerland, rather, uh, in France. It borders France. It's massive uh, hydron, uh, large hydron uh, uh, collider. And, and, and they're smashing protons together, and they're trying to uncover different dimensions. They say they know there's 17 dimensions that exist theoretically. They're trying to figure them out. They're trying to uh, basically get down to the basic building blocks of life uh, and, and discover dark matter and uh, dark energy and, and, and all the rest. But they are turning the reactor on tomorrow during the um, eclipse. I've got an article here from the Daily Mail. CERN uh, to test a $4 billion accelerator on the day of the solar Eclipse, the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerators set to smash protons together on April 8th to search for invisible particles secretly powering our universe. Theories have suggested there are 17 different particle groups and the European Organization for Nuclear Research, better known as CERN, confirmed the existence of one of its large hadron colliders in 2012. Now the team is restarting the LHC with hopes of unraveling more mysteries of the universe, specifically dark matter. It's just, it's just coincidental. It's interesting that they're firing this thing up tomorrow, again, over there in, uh, in Switzerland. Now, at the CERN facility, which is run by atheists primarily, all these astrophysicists are primarily atheists and these uh, theoretical physicists and all the rest, they have a statue of the god Shiva, who's the Hindu god of chaos and destruction, a massive Shiva statue is right in front of CERN where they're doing these tests. It's, it's just, to me, it just blows my mind. Again, you can't make this stuff up. We are living in the last days, I believe. And the Bible predicted the future, and the future is now. We're living in these times. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but he certainly could come back tomorrow. Jesus can come back anytime. He says he's going to come at a time when you're not expecting me. And I would say the majority of people aren't expecting him to come back tomorrow or any time, really. We don't live like uh, we think Jesus is coming back today. If we did, we would change how we live, wouldn't we? If we believe Jesus could come back right now, it would probably affect our behavior and how we treat other people and how we talk and the things we watch and the things we say and the things we do. If we really believe Jesus can come back, what do you want Jesus to catch you doing when he comes back? What do you want him to catch you doing? Uh, because he come, could come back any time, and we want to be ready. Jesus tells us this. We have to end here. Luke 21 and verse 28. Jesus says this. Now, when these things begin to happen, all these things that he predicted about the last days, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near then he spoke to them a parable. He said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. We live in a beautiful place where we have lots of trees and lots of orchards. And we know this. When you see the trees budding, we know summer is around the corner. That's what Jesus says. When they're budding, you see and you know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, all these signs... Know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, he says, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing, that's sexual immorality, with drunkenness, that's insobriety, and with the cares of this life, that's just being concerned with all of the stuff and be more concerned with the stuff than you are with the things of God. He says that that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always, Jesus says, that you may be counted worthy 
to escape all these things that are coming to pass and that you will stand before the Son of Man. That is our hope. The blessed hope of the believer is that we are going to be snatched out of here. We're going to be raptured. Harpazo in the Greek. Raptus in the Latin. Rapture in the English from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the dead in the air. And so we will ever be with the Lord. Yeah, that's the good news. So as we go into this time of, and by the way, we're going to continue this message uh, on Wednesday, and we'll continue it again next Sunday. I've got a lot more material uh, to share on this subject. And if you're not interested, I'm sorry if you're a visitor, I don't hate to apologize from the pulpit, but if you're a visitor here today, it's your first time, uh, we don't always talk about the end of the world, the doom and gloom, and, 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 and you know, uh, that, 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 that the tribulation is right around the corner. Not every, not every service, but um, we do teach the Bible, and we teach through the Bible verse by verse, and we just happen to be teaching through Revelation chapter 13. Maybe God has you here today because he wants you to hear this message. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. And Lord, we do thank you for telling us the future in advance, Lord. It shows us that you exist outside of space and time. You know everything, Lord. You know the end from the beginning. There's nothing even that we do that surprises you. Sometimes we do things that surprise ourselves and we uh, disappoint ourselves. But Lord, there's nothing that surprises you. You know it all. You know the good, the bad, the ugly. You know our past, our present, and our future. And we thank you, Lord, that you know those who are yours, Lord. And, and, Lord, you see us right now, even now, as seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, seated with Christ, who's the head. We are the body of Christ. He's the head. He's seated there, and so we are seated there according to the book of Ephesians. We're seated in the heavenly places right now with you because uh, for, for, for you, God, it's already all done. You know what's coming, and you know at the end that we win. Jesus, you're victorious. You conquered sin and Satan and death and hell when you died on the cross and rose again on the third day. You were in us through the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, and we are in you mystically, spiritually. We are in you. You are in us because we are the body of Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for the promises, Lord, that we're not appointed unto wrath but unto salvation. First Thessalonians 5.9 tells us this, Lord. We don't have to fear what is coming, but we pray you'd strengthen us, Lord. You would strengthen us, Lord, with iron and steel, Lord God, that we would not waver that we would not compromise, Lord, that we would continue to speak the truth in love, Lord God, proclaiming the good news of the gospel message that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and surrenders their life to Christ will be saved. So, Father, bless now our time of communion. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.